Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved. That's what Peter said in his second letter in the third chapter that we read earlier. Don't overlook this one fact. As you read through Peter's second letter, you almost get the sense that it's a last will and testament, that somehow he kind of knew this would be the last thing he would write. And whether Peter knew that or not, in fact, that's what proved to be the case. As in the same year he wrote this, A.D. 60, Peter would be martyred for his faith in Jesus Christ. And knowing that in hindsight, knowing that Peter was writing his last words, I think brings extra emphasis to what he wrote when he says to the church, to the beloved, don't overlook this one fact, beloved. And what is the one fact we are not to overlook? The imminent return of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. Think back to two or three days before Thanksgiving, whether you were having people over to your house or traveling to someone else's house. Was there any day within those two to three days leading up to Thanksgiving that you didn't think about what was coming? The plans you had to make, the preparations you had to make, the people that were coming over, ones you were excited to see, maybe some you weren't so excited to see. Even if you were doing nothing for Thanksgiving, like I know some of you were looking forward to, in those two to three days leading up to Thanksgiving, was any of those days devoid of you thinking, boy, I can't wait to do nothing? I'm sure every one of those days you thought about it. How strange it is, then, that those who profess to believe in Jesus could so easily overlook this one fact, that at any moment, He can appear for the final time with his angels in glory before our very eyes. Our reading in 2 Peter, by the way, isn't even the first time that Peter is writing these words to the church. If we look at chapter 3 and the verses just before our text for today, Peter says from the beginning, this is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring you up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. I'd say that doesn't sound all too unfamiliar. You Christians believe that Jesus is going to come back. You've been saying that for 2,000 years. Where is he? But that's the way Jesus said it was going to be. In fact, he said the closer we get to that day, the more we'll hear that. The closer his time dawns, the more people will not only ignore it, mock it, make fun of it, scoff at it, but even some who did believe won't. They'll ignore it, even reject it. Back in 2013, ABC ran a news story that I kept because it struck me as being so impactful for this text. It's the story of a man named Jeff Bush, who was 36 years old, and who in the middle of the night disappeared. He disappeared into a 30-foot wide by 20-foot deep sinkhole that collapsed 
directly underneath his bedroom in his house. And half of that house fell into that sinkhole in a split second. The family members that survived said that it sounded like a train had literally plowed through the side of the house. They tried to look for him, but it was too late. Tragically, Jeff died in the collapse. When Jeff Bush went to bed that night, I don't think him or his family ever would have conceived that the earth would literally open up that night and swallow him. Of course, had Jeff or his family known or even had the slightest indication that this freak accident was possible, I'm pretty certain most people would make preparations or at the very least just get out and not stick around. But sadly, no warning was given. Here in Nebraska, we have regular warnings of things. When I first came here, I had to get used to that every Wednesday afternoon during tornado season. Tornado warnings that prepare us for a day that we don't know is coming, but most likely will come. Back in California, they weren't tornado warnings. They were literally warnings that at any moment the earth could open up underneath your feet in California in an earthquake. I'm sure you've all been driving down the road and been startled by the emergency broadcasting system. All of these things put in place to get your attention, to heighten your alertness, and to make an immediate and effective change to your behavior so that when that day comes, you are not surprised. You are prepared. I'm always left both heartbroken and honestly a little bit frustrated when I watch the news of a hurricane that we all knew was coming, and yet residents in those neighborhoods said, I've lived here for 20 years, I've been through worse, this time isn't going to be any different. And despite the fire engines, despite the police, despite the warnings, they stay. But that time was different. As reckless and unreasonable as that may seem to us, when it comes to God's warnings of the imminent end of the world and the imminent return of his son, we would be no less stubborn and foolish if we did not hear those warnings and take immediate action now, not knowing when that day will come make immediate changes in our life, and trust that the God of the universe doesn't cry wolf. In our passage from 2 Peter today, Peter says that the last and final of God, day of God's judgment will come like a thief. Beloved, don't overlook this fact. Disciples, don't overlook it. Perhaps Peter was so adamant about this with the church entrusted to him because he remembers how shocked he was when he first heard those words from his Lord. In Matthew 25, we're at the end of our Lord's discussion and discourse about the end times, a discussion that began privately with Peter and his disciples back in chapter 24. When they asked Jesus, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? They asked, what is going to be the sign and when is it going to come? And I'm sure it was rather alarming for the disciples and us if we're listening, when after asking Jesus what will be the sign and when will it happen, he didn't answer their question at all at first. Instead, he just tells them, see that no one leads you astray. See that you're not duped. Don't overlook. These were disciples. These were the ones Jesus called to follow him. And yet he even says to them, don't be fooled. Jesus then teaches about the signs of the end. But through all of it, he says these signs are just the beginning of the end. This is just going to keep happening over and over and over again until I come. And so he says to them in Matthew 24, verse 36, concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of, of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Therefore, you disciples, stay awake. You do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not 
expect. Then to reinforce that point again, he tells the parable of the ten virgins. Ten wise, or five wise, five foolish. And by the end of that parable, Jesus says in Matthew 25, 13, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. That's four times in one conversation the disciples heard, Disciples, you can miss it. Don't miss it. Watch. Stay awake. Don't fall asleep. Are you hearing me? Let me tell you another parable, the parable of the talents, about the wise servants who, even though the master left and they didn't know when he was going to come back, it says at once they got to work because what they believed was coming had a direct impact on how they lived that day. You and I, along with the disciples, just heard God himself tell us multiple times, watch, watch, watch. I think Dr. Jeffrey A. Gibbs sums it up nicely when he tells us what Jesus is really trying to get across in his warning to us. If Christians fail to look for the return of Christ, they could lose their faith and fall away from the Lord. It is as simple as that. If Jesus is not coming to judge the living and the dead, or if I do not frame my life and all things in that way, then I open myself up to distraction and temptation because I do not really have to take things seriously. Failure to watch for Christ to come can deaden that awareness, cause us to lose our vigilance, and open us to dangerous temptation, and we could fall and be found among the goats and not the sheep. Sobering words, but Jesus' words, because he doesn't want that to happen. He wants all to be saved. Jesus said there's no way to anticipate it. There's no secret biblical math you're going to work out that's going to tell you the day that he's coming, so you can just get ready two or three days beforehand. The warnings have been given, and as of this morning, you have heard them. The time to prepare our hearts and minds to meet our Maker and stand for the Almighty is now. Not tomorrow, not after work, not after the next sporting event, not after just one more episode on Netflix, but now. After all, it says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, Children, it is the last hour. And as you've heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. Never mind the last day. John just brought it down to the last hour. 2,000 years ago, he said, it's over. There's nothing left to happen. There's no headlines left to read. There's no wars that have to be fought that are a precursor to Jesus coming back. No, he can come back any moment, even 2,000 years ago. We are and have been in the end times. And the single and last promise waiting to be fulfilled in Scripture is the coming of Christ once and for all. Those who fail to heed God's warnings risk being caught unprepared and judged. However, this is not what God desires, which is why he tells us this parable. As Peter reassures us in verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. The only thing keeping Jesus from coming back before I'm done preaching is his love for the world. He will endure even more hardship himself, even more persecution of his saints, even more martyrs for the sake of those who haven't believed coming to believe. He desires that all men should come to repentance. Peter said to be, wet, to be ready. Our Lord said to watch, to be prepared. So how is it that we prepare for that day? What is the evacuation plan, if that's what you want to call it, that we are to put in place and be practicing 
to know for certain that in that day we won't be caught unaware? Well, Peter tells us in verses 11 through 13, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. What sort of people are you to be? You are to be people of the promise, people of the word of God. The promises of God brought to us by the Lord himself through the blood of apostles, through the blood of generations of martyrs before us that have heralded the truth to us. How we receive and how we believe the word of God that we hear today, Jesus reveals is how he will separate the sheep and the goats tomorrow. How we receive the word of God that comes to us, that has been given to you each and every day, today, is what will separate sheep and goats on that last day. And it's not just the word that we have heard. It's also the written word. Don't overlook this one fact, beloved. What does that translate to today? Here's what I think that translates to. We live in a time where we've had more access to the Bible than any other time in history. You have it on your phone. You have translations, too many to count. And yet, biblical literacy has never been lower. In a time when people can know their Bibles, on the whole, we don't. You see, don't overlook this one fact, beloved. The shepherd calls now. He calls to you through his word, and not just the written word, but through the church, through the ministry of word and sacrament that comes to you through his apostles, his pastors, his missionaries, his teachers. How you receive that word today is what will separate sheep and goats. And we see this in Jesus' word in verse 40. Truly, truly, I say to you, as it, you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Who are the brothers? Well, as you look through the New Testament, almost every single time Jesus references brothers, he's speaking about his apostles, the ones that he sent in his stead to proclaim his word. As you did it to the least of these whom, from, from whom you've heard the word of God, so it will be done to you. Just like the ten virgins, just like the parable of the talents, how we receive and wait in the word of God today reveals what we believe is coming tomorrow. It's as John, or Jesus said in John 8, 31 to 32. It's our memory verse for the past few weeks in our school devotions. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The good news of the gospel is that we don't have to wait for the last day to have a relationship with our Lord. He's given us his word to which we live with and know him by now. That same word of God that Jesus himself used when he was tempted by the devil, when he said in Matthew 4 verse 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So don't overlook this one fact, beloved. You live now and you live forever by grace, through faith, in the word of God. Even today, the word of the Lord has come to you. So live as if the kingdom of God is already at hand, as if it's already in your midst, because it is. Amen. Please stand.